I'll try to go through as quickly as possible uh, that there's still time for questions, but I don't want to go too fast so I can also get the content across. Um, the content, uh, I'd like to be talking a little bit about the entire uh, Smack stack. You might have heard about it. It's basically when I want to build like fast data pipelines, and we will see in a second what this is all about. Uh, I actually, I need some other tools. So we have heard a lot about Spark. So I'll just be talking a little bit about like this typical architectural pattern and challenges involved when building such kind of pipelines. Uh, me, that's Jörg Schad. I'm a software engineer at Mesosphere, uh, where I mostly work on the Apache Mesos project. And in my free time or uh, whenever it comes up, I also like to uh, go around and talk a little bit about this cool work we're doing. Ancient times, it was actually all very simple. Like uh, 10 years ago, we only had uh, MapReduce around and people just had like a big Hadoop cluster standing somewhere in their basement and there was like no contention. So I didn't, also didn't have any choice. Today, it's a little more challenging because we actually, we need to move faster. We have realized that the traditional uh, Hadoop MapReduce uh, is too slow for our purposes. So uh, nowadays, uh, we're actually looking at other solutions, including Spark streaming. But uh, if we look at the entire ecosystem of data processing, there are kind of different use cases. So there's batch processing, then there, which is still like the traditional MapReduce. We still see that being used from time to time. Uh, then there's like this micro-batching where I need to have faster uh, latency times, so somewhere between minutes and seconds. Uh, and this is where Spark or then Spark Streaming is really good. And then there's even uh, use cases where I need something even faster, event processing. For example, my credit card data. If I'm using my credit card uh, somewhere and they need to check whether this is a valid transaction or not, I don't want to wait for like tens of seconds until I get a response. So what we are usually seeing is that uh, many companies or many users they actually have use cases for each of those uh, buckets. Um, and we will see a little bit how we can actually uh, satisfy all those different needs. If we talk about fast data pipelines, and this is then typical where it really needs those low response times, a typical thing, I, how I could set this up, I have Kafka as a message bus, so all my data, uh, for example, my credit card data or my sensor data is being put into Kafka, and then from there, Spark Streaming can actually pick it up. It might re write the results to Cassandra, persist some uh, of the findings it has while analyzing this data. And there might actually also be a microservice which is either picking up the data from Spark or from Cassandra and then actually uh, is going to present some response. For example, credit card transaction valid or invalid. If we do that, if we look at that a little more abstract, so um, there might be a message bus involved, which is basically the ingestion queue. So uh, I usually I want to have, I don't want to write all my sensor data directly into something which Spark uh, would be consuming. So I want to have like a buffer in between for multiple reasons. First of all, for uh, load balancing. So there might be just uh, a really high load of data at certain points. So a typical example uh, would be, for example, airplanes. All those modern airplanes, they have tons of sensors on them. And while they fly, they collect a lot of data. And once they land, they actually sync uh, together with uh, the analytics system. And at that point in time, I have like a lot of messages coming in, which might actually be more than my streaming system can handle at that point in time. So it's really good to have like this queue and buffer in between, which can help me to uh, disperse this workload. Secondly, uh, also just for fault tolerance, uh, I might have a short outage in my analytics system, but as long as my message queue is set up in a very fault tolerant way, and this is usually what they're really good at, uh, I can still satisfy all those uh, data needs. Okay, then we have our analytics layer doing the actual magic, and we heard a lot of talks about that already in the last days, and uh, that's basically where I get like my insight into this data I'm collecting. But then at the end, I also need to kind of persist and action on this data. And this is where I usually have like some distributed storage uh, or some microservice and displaying it or acting up on this data. So this is just like a more general representation of the earlier image. And if we actually put that in a pipeline, uh, on the left we have events, those are being ingested. 
uh, they are being analyzed, stored, and then we can actually act up on this data. So this is like a typical fast data pipeline if we're talking about uh, such kind of, or this is how I would use this term, fast data pipeline. And then one instantiation, uh, which is actually pretty common for the stack, I see you, if you recall the first image we saw, uh, this is actually the instantiation of the first image. It's a so-called SMAC stack. So SMAC stands for Spark, which we hopefully all know. Um, Mesos as kind of the underlying layer, gluing all of those different tools together. Uh, A stands for ACA, which is then kind of the acting system uh, at the end, visualizing data or uh, kind of notifying my users. C stands for Apache Cassandra, and K is our ingestion queue, our message queue, Apache Kafka. Um, but Smack Stack is just one potential instantiation. And if we look at just the Smack Stack, for me, it's usually, it's this kind of um, fast data pipeline, basically following those different uh, pipeline steps. But at each of those pipeline steps, I actually have different options of how to implement that. And uh, let's start by, looking, uh, by taking a look at the message queues. So message queues, most of us probably know Apache Kafka, but there are actually also other solutions around. So RabbitMQ, FluentD, if we're going to look at our different cloud providers, uh, AWS, cloud, uh, Google Cloud, they own, all have their own implementations. And uh, that's maybe the only thing where I would be really careful of using them because that usually ties me in into one particular API. So all the tools above there are open source tools and I can actually migrate. So I can start out by developing my fast data stack on the cloud and then I can actually move over to an on-prem data center by using the same tools. So Apache Kafka, this is the one I also see most frequently used uh, in uh, practice. So, I usually like to describe it as basically like one big pipe to which I can pipe data. So it's really high throughput, uh, publish, su subscribe. And what I really like about it is the persistence um, which I get. So actually I can write data into my Kafka stream and I can have multiple consumers uh, consuming it later out of it. So if we just switch back to, our, to this picture, where we have uh, here also storage involved, I can actually use Kafka, uh, Kafka as kind of a storage in between. I have to be kind of careful because at some point, depending on my settings, uh, of course it will be deleted, but for short-term uh, storage, I can actually utilize Kafka in many use cases uh, rather well. Other options, um, as I said, all of those options here, they actually have their use case. Uh, so uh, it really makes sense to look at different alternatives. And so for example, if I'm doing uh, more like log analytics, uh, FluentD might be a good option, uh, basically collecting all my logs because that's also kind of a stream processing. I get a lot of logs in and I want to throw them out to different uh, subscribers which might do different alerting or analytics on top of them. So this yields the question how to choose. As I said, there's no like uh, one fits all solution. Um, as a default start, I would usually say if you start up with Kafka, you're probably not doing too much uh, wrong, but if you get more into it, you actually should look at several different aspects. So first of all, scalability. What is the kind of message data you're actually processing or the kind of event data you're pushing through your system? Um, what kind of delivery guarantees do you need? And uh, also, do you have the need for routing capabilities? Uh, as with all open source tools, I would also have a look how vibrant is the community? Is there actually enough backing for the community that I can be sure that this open source project will still be alive in two or three years time? Delivery guarantees, and this is something I should just be aware of when uh, dealing with message queues. It's basically, um, what is the guarantee when I put in a message into the queue, how often will it be delivered at the end? Do I have a, at most one semantic, which basically means a message in failure cases, it might be lost, but uh, it's never re-delivered. So I can actually be sure that I won't see duplicate events uh, at the output. At least once is kind of the opposite. Uh, messages, once it's been written to the queue, I can be sure that it will be always delivered. Um, but it might actually be delivered twice. And this is then where my application actually also has to be aware of that and for example, do duplicate checking by some, some key attribute, for example. 
exactly wants. This is actually what most of us want or what we would expect when looking at that. But uh, as we are talking about distributed systems here, there are always failure cases when an exactly one semantic will fail. I can do a lot to mitigate it and really reduce the number of cases where this will happen. But there are always really tiny corner cases where that won't happen. So um, this is just exactly once would make it really easy to program our applications. Just in practice, this is really, really hard to achieve in distributed systems. Routing capabilities. So Kafka, if we're dealing with Kafka, we have a simple pipe. It's going in and it's going out at the other side. Um, with uh, other tools such as RabbitMQ, I can actually have more complex routing decisions based on message type, based on content. I can actually route my message somewhere else. This, of course, has implications to scalability because there needs to be more logic in the tool, whereas Kafka is really just piping through all messages. Uh, so that's what I meant in the beginning when you should look at what is your use case, what do you actually need from your application. Let's look at the next uh, section, and this is stream processing. And I'll be a little blunt here and talk about the other options uh, despite Apache Spark uh, as well, um, because actually uh, they might make sense in certain uh, scenarios. So if we look at stream processing, and if we look at the different tools which are out there, these are the ones I most frequently see, and over the last two to three years, there's really been like a large growth of different tools. Um, so probably the one I see most frequently is still a, is Apache Spark. Uh, but uh, if I look at, for example, Flink, uh, this is really coming up. Storm is a little declining. Uh, but there are also many people using other tools. Um, Apache Spark, we probably all know. And this is probably, uh, I just put up this picture to show uh, one of the big advantages, and this is basically, if I use Spark streaming, I can use the same thing, the same infrastructure, mostly the same jobs for also doing uh, batch analytics, for also being integrated in all my other infrastructure. So I can actually reuse a lot, and I don't need a specialized infrastructure for one specific tool. Um, so just what we should be aware is actually Spark is using those uh, little tiny batches. Um, we heard about it in the keynotes already. Um, and that actually gives me some overhead uh, in terms of latency, um, which I can mitigate if I actually do native processing, which we'll see in one slide. So how do I actually choose between all those options? First of all, it's the execution model, which often is driven by my latency requirements. So how low latency do I actually need? Um, also, it's a fault tolerance granularity. And uh, so it's how often do I create a checkpoint? How much do I have to recompute when there are failures? And uh, one thing playing in there is also the notion of uh, time. So what kind of notion do I have uh, as time? Do I, am I talking about processing time? So when I get in an event, um, do I consider the time step at which it arrives at my stream processor? Or can I support something like event time? Uh, so each event uh, has a timestamp when it's being created. And I can actually uh, utilize that both for aggregation and also for uh, fault tolerance uh, windows. Um, delivery guarantees, again, we saw that before. API is also a big topic. So do I have to rewrite all my jobs, or can I just reuse all the batch jobs or almost reuse all the batch jobs I already have? So uh, execution model, I said there is a typical distinction is the micro-batching versus like the more native streaming where I actually process each individual event, which might be useful, for example, in this credit card example when I really want a low latency response. But in many other cases, it's actually OK to wait for five or 10 um, other events and then process them together in a batch. Uh, false tolerance and say checkpoint per batch moved. Should supposed to be in the middle. Uh, so that's basically the question, how many checkpoints do I create? Do I checkpoint per individual tuple, or do I checkpoint per batch of data? And so for example, even those native uh, streamers which are considering when processing each individual tuple, they often still uh, create those uh, fault tolerance checkpoints per batch, because otherwise it would simply be too expensive to create. And that basically means how much data do you have to recompute if there's a failure? Delivery guarantees, uh, so 
And this is moving on the slide, sorry for that. Uh, so Storm has kind of this notion of exactly once. Other tools, uh, they say at least once to exactly once. So it's kind of, it's, it's a moving stream because most of them will tell you they want to be exactly once, but it's really uh, necessary to look at those corner cases where this doesn't happen uh, anymore and what kind of guarantees you have in those corner cases uh, when there are nodes failing, uh, when there's network failings, uh, failures, and so on. So, uh, next tool to talk about would be storage. And with storage, we even have more options. So just looking at like this vast horizon of different storage tools, uh, I have a lot of different options. And so usually the first thing I do to get an overview of what might be the best tool for the use case I'm working on is I'm looking at the data model. So do I have relational data? So relational data, this is like my traditional MySQL Postgres where I have uh, joins between two tables where I might have foreign keys and a fixed schema. Um, if I actually don't need all of that, because this relational overhead actually makes it hard to implement it or harder to implement it in a distributed way, uh, key value stores are really simple to implement and therefore also really scalable. And they basically just take a single val key value and can store that in different fashions. If I have a graph-like structure like a social network, uh, like a road network where I connect uh, individual nodes, a graph store might be the best thing. If I have some document, so documents is this typical like user data. So user data, they have some kind of schema, a user might have hobbies, a user might have a Facebook page, a Twitter handle, but those could be varying quite a lot between different users. So it might not make sense to store it in the relational model where I have to create that attribute for all users in my database, but I kind of have a more flexible schema uh, for my document store. Um, and especially when we are talking about fast data and sensor data, we often have repeating uh, values. So for example, a temperature reading, it's usually it's the same data type every five minutes, and usually between two consecutive readings, also the temperature won't jump too much in experience and in the expected case. So those time series data stores that can actually do that very efficiently. And there's still this use case uh, for files, so HDFS is probably the most commonly used one, but there are also people using Ceph, Coobite, which is a German startup, so also there I actually have a number of options. What does it mean for our data center? As said, in the beginning it was just this one big Hadoop cluster, but nowadays we actually have many different tools. So uh, usually what we still often see is that people go, they have this large cluster somewhere in their basement, and now they go, they take the first 10 nodes, put it to Spark Hadoop, they take the next 10 nodes, uh, create a sub Kafka cluster, and so on and so on. So they actually go and subpartition their cluster into many smaller tools. And this has multiple disadvantages. First of all, uh, it's, it, it requires a manual operator overhead because an operator has to keep track and if there are node failures, he might have to shift nodes from one subpartition to the other in my cluster. So it's usually nothing uh, the operations team will be too happy about. The other disadvantage is that the uh, utilization usually is pretty low because uh, we are wasting in each of those subpartitions uh, in each of those subclusters, we actually need to provision them for the maximum workload. So we're actually wasting resources uh, whenever we are not having this maximum uh, resource utilization. So this is kind of the vision behind the Apache Mesos project, which was originally de developed uh, with Twitter and UC Berkeley together as kind of the vision uh, to utilize and uh, just view the entire data center as like one big resource pool. So I don't care about uh, individual nodes so much anymore. Uh, I'd simply want to view everything as like one big entity. And this is similar as with my laptop. Right now my laptop, it has multiple CPUs, but I don't care which uh, CPU is being used by Keynote to show that presentation. I simply want that something is showing my presentation here. So uh, as I said, it's an Apache top-level project. It's being used, I believe many of you, uh, if not most, have actually used it in, in the background. So uh, for example, Netflix, 
Whenever you use Siri before, you have used an Apache Mesos cluster, Twitter, Airbnb, and uh, the nice thing, being a Mesos developer, is that those are really large clusters. So those are multiple 10,000 nodes, and this is kind of need to write software for such kind of large clusters. From the architecture, and this is exactly why it's kind of so fitting for all the different schedulers, uh, for all those different frameworks, it's that we actually have um, application-specific schedulers on top. And this is what usually is referenced as two-level scheduling, whereas Mesos is basically taking care of the resource uh, management. So uh, what will happen is I have a Spark scheduler. And by the way, Spark was originally co-developed with Apache Mesos and was kind of a showcase project of how easy it is to write those schedulers on top of Apache Mesos. So, uh, both Spark and Mesos have like a co-joint history at UC Berkeley. Uh, but the nice thing is that it can actually have multiple schedulers. So I can have a Spark scheduler, I can have a Cassandra scheduler, and maybe something scheduling all my containers in my infrastructure. And now all Mesos is doing, Mesos is asking each of those schedulers, hey, I currently have five CPUs in my cluster. Can you utilize them? And then it's actually up to the cluster to decide what it wants to start there. Because this logic is actually quite uh, application specific. So a Spark scheduler might be looking for way different kind of nodes in terms of computing resources, in terms of co-location, as for example, a container scheduler scheduling uh, stateless uh, containers, which doesn't care wherever they start. So it, he'll accept any offer it gets. And so this is kind of the idea of this two-level scheduling that each framework, each different application actually needs some application-specific logic, but in order to keep that minimal, we can write a simple scheduler, which is uh, then in responsible for managing the framework. And the same holds ca uh, true in case of failures, and there it's even more uh, necessary to have this kind of custom logic. Imagine an HDFS cluster where two name nodes have failed. All of a sudden, I actually need to recover from uh, my journal nodes. And uh, the scheduler can take care of that, but in old times, there would have been an operator have to step in. And now I can actually codify this logic into such kind of schedulers. Okay, just if I'm looking at pure methods, there are still challenges. So we usually describe Mesos as just the kernel of an uh, operating system, but there's actually need for more as this entire operating system. So I need the actual schedulers on top, I need monitoring, I need security, I need some kind of access management. Uh, usually I also want a CLI, and if I have, as in, on like my iPhone, on my Mac, if I still have a package repository, which makes it really easy to install Spark, Cassandra, and all those other tools, this is also great. So we have the need for some kind of operating system for my cluster. And this is kind of where DCOS, another open source project, comes in. And just real brief, so uh, DCOS is basically a distribution around Apache Mesos. Again, it's uh, open source, and uh, it gives me all those tools I actually need to operate it. Um, the main incentive to create something like DCOS was that uh, if you look at all those big companies running Mesos, Twitter, uh, Apple, Airbnb, they actually have large operation teams which can actually deal uh, with all those challenges as different schedulers, as service discovery. But most of us, we don't want to care about it. We want something which actually gives me all of that out of the box. And so this is kind of the vision behind DCOS, just make it easy to install. Next topic is actually those services, those schedulers, they sound cool. They can do a lot, but it's actually, it's very challenging to write them. I have to consider failures, and this could be task failures, node failures, network failures. And the hard thing about failures in distributed systems, it's, it's really difficult to detect a failure. If a node has failed, that's easy. But if a node uh, or a network is dropping every 50% of my package, it's something different and very difficult to detect. I usually, if I have a service such as Spark, I want to be able to upgrade from one version to the other without impacting my users actually running something on top. I have to deal with persistence, uh, especially if, I have, if I'm writing something like Cassandra. I actually need to deal with uh, writing data uh, and persisting them across node failures, uh, across uh, maintenance, if I want to restart a server, for example, because it's getting new RAM or something else. 
so I have to deal with persistence. I usually I want to run multiple frameworks, and this might even mean I want to run multiple Spark frameworks on the same cluster. And then I said, if I run it anywhere in this big resource pool, I have to deal with service discovery. I have to figure out how can I actually connect to that without knowing explicitly on which server it's running. How can I collect metrics, and so on and so on. And just to symbolize how complex it is, this is basically like a state diagram for dealing with persistent services. Uh, you don't really have to look at it in too much detail. It's basically, it's just quite complex to really do persistence in the right way. So now it's a question, how can we actually operate and develop those distributed services? And uh, therefore we have uh, kind of and called SDK, and, or we have this pyramid of different options of how to create those services. Um, the old option on Mesos used to be write your own scheduler. And, uh, the, uh, and um, Spark was one of those first examples where actually we wrote uh, our own first scheduler with uh, Spark. And this is usually quite tedious and it takes a lot of time because you really have to understand what's going on. You have to write a lot of code. So usually you don't want to do that. So the idea is to kind of have this SDK, which gives you some kind of defaults. And if you ever use Docker Compose, this is actually as simple as that. You specify a YAML file, which tells uh, the scheduler uh, what kind of persistence guarantees you want, what you want to do in uh, terms of restarts, what kind of containers or jobs you want to schedule. So this works for like uh, many use cases, so for example, uh, Cassandra, it's really just a few lines of YAML and some uh, Java classes because uh, for, and this is here the middle part, for some custom strategies as for example recovery, this is really hard to put it in a general uh, YAML file and there you might actually still go in and write some specific uh, Java code only for, for example, for like the recovery scenario, or if we take it again, HDFS as an example, only for this case where two name nodes are failing, because the default should be covered uh, up here with my YAML file. So it's actually, it's really easy to develop them, and this is what we have also done. We have developed all these Smack stack components kind of uh, with this SDK, except Spark at the moment. Now it's demo time, but as I only have two minutes 30 left, I would actually skip the demo. Uh, we would have seen a demo, and this is one of the nice parts about this kind of pipeline as well, uh, where I have a data generator uh, writing data into Kafka, and then I actually have two processing frameworks. I have Spark uh, looking for one kind of fraud in this data, and I actually can co-deploy Flink uh, listening to the same Kafka stream, and then both of them, they're actually writing their results back into Kafka, and then I have a display uh, which would actually show me uh, combined what both tools found. So this is one of those really nice things if I'm using uh, Kafka here, because it actually allows me to have multiple consumers, and I can actually branch. I can have one team which is using uh, Spark, I can have another team using Flink uh, for different use cases. After showing a demo, I usually find showing demos, it's really cool, you see something happening really fast, but in my opinion, spinning up such demos, this is the easy thing. The hard thing, if you're talking about production use cases, actually how do you keep it running at the end? So whenever you try to design such kind of fast data stack or any architecture in general, uh, you should look at the service operations, so, or we also call them day two operations. So what does it actually take to keep such kind of cluster running? I have to consider configuration upgrades. I want to reconfigure my Spark uh, cluster, my Spark subcluster. I want to upgrade to a new Spark version. I want to upgrade my cluster from a Mesos version to the next uh, without impacting the running cluster. How do I do monitoring and how do I also do debugging in a scalable way? Do I have to give SSH access to all nodes to my developers or is there a di different, better way to actually do that? So those is basically, just whenever you design such kind of fast data pipeline, not only consider how can I spin it up, what gives me best results, but also what can I actually maintain in a, in a good and a scalable fashion. And that actually gives us 22 seconds for questions. <laughs> No questions? 
Hi. 10 seconds uh, left. Good, good presentation. All right, do my best. Um, you mentioned that uh, there is this scheduler API to uh, post things or get things running on this EOS. Is it different for Spark that it has its own scheduler that was built for Mesos? And would it have to change if you want to run it on this EOS, or will we no. use the same thing? No, no. So what I would have shown you in the demo is basically if I go into my cluster, I have here, I kind of have this catalog, which is kind of the store. And here, we basically, we have the Spark scheduler. So it doesn't matter. What the uh, SDK will do, it will generate such scheduler for you. It just means you don't have to write all the code from scratch mm -hmm. and consider all corner cases. So uh, this basically, if I now click deploy, this is how I can easily spin up my Spark cluster on DCOS. So here, if we look at services, this is now the scheduler coming up, and once the scheduler is actually up and running, it will deploy all other tasks in my cluster. Okay, but given that Spark contains a Mesos scheduler, does it make a two-level scheduling? So what you're running there is a driver, and it's using your scheduler, yeah. and then... This, this what's yeah. running there, this is basically the, uh, the driver, the scheduler. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay, that's all the time we Thank have. You. Thank uh, you so thank much. Thank you, Jörg. You can take further questions in the back. And the next talk will begin at 11.40.